Very excited to bring on our uh, next guest. It is Josh Pate at Josh Pate CFB on Twitter. And I, I got to be honest, I, I, I'm a little discombobulated. There's been a lot of change in the last week. I got new logos. I got a new Twitter handle. Yep. I got a new show name. Yeah. This is like this is a lot of change for me for uh, the start of the season. Yeah, when we started interviewing versus where he is now, like <laughs> you blow up like this, things I'm, have to change. I'm shocked he still answers when we call, to be <laughs> honest with you. Josh, what's the last week been like for you? We got all new stuff for you going on over there. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I thought I was dealing with professionals here. Are you just going to bury the lead? We've got a new mascot, guys. <laughs> yeah, no, you got a new mascot on top of it, too, man. <laughs> It's been it's been interesting. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but sometimes in the corporate media world, you put forth a request in February, and everyone goes on vacation in the summer. Yeah. And so you have to wait until right up against the start of the season for anyone to finally press go on things. And so everything got pushed up to the beginning of the season. So what you've witnessed this week is like a fire hose to the face. <laughs> what I wanted it to be was a slow trickle, like a, in a little Japanese garden, and we do one thing a month. But either way, we got here. Yeah, we're excited for you, man. Congratulations on all the stuff that's been happening. It's a lot of success your way, and it's deserved. I, I do want to ask you quickly before we dive into what seems like from outside of Oregon and Washington, a good college football week one slate. What what would we expect? I talked about this earlier. You're going to be doing the CBS stream show, the college football pregame show on Saturday. What what are we to expect tuning into that this weekend? Yeah. So that um, from my from my standpoint, nothing changes on my end. I'll be at the same game I would normally choose to go to every weekend. I will uh, participate in that show remotely from that venue. This week it'll be at Florida. Next week TBD. Uh, they've got a lot of different talent there. The feel is. There is still a lot of oxygen in the Saturday morning space, um, and it's the digital world. It's CBSSportsHQ.com. It's not just um, linear. And mm -hmm. so uh, just to try some things out because I think, I think folks here realize what we have in conjunction with CBS owning 24-7 is you've got the network of team insiders that are on the ground in stadiums morning of game. None of the other networks have that. And so a lot of the late-breaking stuff, that it's really hard to pivot on if you don't have eyes and boots on the ground, that's where you can specialize. A lot of folks love betting on this stuff. They want up to the minute information. That's where you can carve out your niche and specialize in that. And not to mention a lot of the other traditional coverage that you get on a Saturday morning pregame show. Well, I know there's a lot of fans on the West Coast who are not pleased with the hand that ESPN and Fox has had in realignment and are looking for options and they don't want to incorporate with the other pregame shows. So it's an awesome opportunity to pick up some uh, some audience members out here on the West Coast. I, you hear the coach speak stuff in week one, and I just am so jacked for this week to get here. Uh, coaches largely say, you know, they're excited to find out who their team is. You go through fall camp, you have an idea. Hell, a week ago we were having conversations about Florida State having the best defensive line in the country, and then Georgia Tech dominated the line of scrimmage. I'm curious to ask you this, Josh. Who are you most excited to learn about this weekend? Like, is there one team that you can circle and say, I, I have an idea, but I, I can't wait to find out what they have? Yeah, it's, it's the reason I'm going to the game I'm going to, actually. It's got to be Miami. Miami is, for all intents and purposes, an SEC team physically. I went and watched them practice a couple of weeks ago, and that is – it's not quite to the level depth-wise of what an Alabama or a Georgia looks like. But front-end guys, they look just like Bama and Georgia. So we know how Bama and Georgia play because they do it consistently every year. How does Miami play? I think you stay in that same conference. You could ask the same thing about Clemson. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think it's just so fascinating that we had the 24-7 the sports guys the other day put out the team talent composite. They do it at the beginning of every year. And I thought it was really eye-opening because it's more of the same. Bama number one. Georgia two, Ohio State three. Those are the most talented rosters to start the season. But Clemson's number five. And yet Clemson is nearly a two-touchdown underdog to Georgia in Atlanta. And that is a neutral field game, by the way, because as close as Athens is, Clemson isn't much further away from Atlanta. So they'll be well represented there. That's just – that is a glaring perceived gap in those teams. I also think A&M with Mike Elko, I think they're going to be a lot better than folks expect. And they are going up against a Notre Dame offensive line with six returning starts across the entire front. They are going to trot out a true freshman in Kyle Field at night to face what is still a very, very stacked Texas A&M front. And yet a and is only a two-and-a-half point favorite hmm. because I think Notre Dame could do a lot to slow that Aggie offense down as well. So 
Uh, I mean, it's week one. I don't, I don't know anything about anything. Florida <laughs> State kind of threw me in a blender. Yeah, I think through everybody threw a blender to lose outright. One thing to be close uh, in, on a game. I'm with you on the ramen noodle, too. I love A&M over Notre Dame this weekend. But again, to your point, we don't know who people are yet. we got to figure it out. Um, USC LSU is a standalone Sunday. And I, I know you'll be traveling back. But when you watch that, you said yesterday, there's some things that JP Poll's got you nervous, got right? You like, nervous. we don't know who everybody <laughs> is yet. LSU, USC, what's your read or feel on that one? Because I've gone back and forth. I think I'm going to lean Lincoln keeps it close. But L- pretty big year for Brian Kelly down at LSU. Huge year for both. Uh, their careers are intertwined. They both just dumped their defensive staffs. And so there's a lot of correlation here. It is the most unpredictable high-level game of week one. It's the only game where if we got into a debate right now, we had like an hour and I heard everyone's argument, either one of you could convince me either team wins by double digits and I could end up believing you. Because there's one world where it's so academic and LSU doesn't overthink the room and they use that big physical offensive line. They got one of the best in the country. They have a really improved backfield at the tailback position, and they just lean on an undersized, outmanned USC front, and they shorten the game, and it looks a lot like what Michigan did to Penn State last year. There's one world where that happens. There's another world where Lincoln Riley's never had a bad quarterback, and Miller Moss won't be a bad quarterback either. He'll be really good. And there's a world where LSU's secondary is still bad, and USC pops them, and USC's up 10 to nothing or 14 to nothing early, L- and LSU has to play from behind, therefore they can't bleed the clock and run, and, uh, and run the ball. And they have to ask Garrett Nussmeyer, who was a little turnover prone in fall camp, to put the game on his shoulders and win the game throwing the football, which could lead to more mistakes, and then USC wins by double digits. So I, I'm glad I don't have to predict the thing until tomorrow <laughs> night because I still haven't landed. Uh, but I, like, I honestly, that, I, got a, I had a feel on every other game. I, I, I'm not kidding you. When I say I have no feel on where I'm going to go, I have no feel for the game. I think that's why it's so exciting on Sunday night. Josh Pate is our guest at Josh Pate CFB on Twitter. Go give him a follow every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. The Josh Pate College Football Show live on YouTube, five o'clock Pacific time. You can also check the podcast as well and see him every Saturday morning uh, live from whatever game he is at, which we'll have to get to because he's going to have a tough decision on October twelfth. And I'm curious where he's leaning right now. Who's the Who's the clubhouse leader? The College Football Pregame Show on CBS Sports HQ. I I find myself, Josh. I know you've been talking about it and tweeting about it. The Connor Stallions documentary comes out on Netflix. I, I'm having a hard time caring. Like, I've just kind of moved on. Season's beginning. I'm ready for this year. A lot of those people are gone. He's out. I know Sharon Moore was a part of that. Sh- should I care more? Should that matter more to me? I just, I have a hard time buying into that being a big deal in the NCAA dropping a hammer on them. I don't think the documentary was a big deal. I think it was an eye opener if you wanted to know who Connor Stallions is. There's one piece of information that I had to sit on for a little while. And that is the NCAA did interview Stallions, which it was finally revealed, and he recorded the whole thing. So he was sitting there with a recorded Zoom interview of his interrogation with the NCAA, and it was about five hours long. You ended up seeing about 30 seconds of it. So that ended up not being a big deal, but I was very curious about what different layer that could add. Um, Anyone who watched that documentary yesterday, one of the first takeaways was Harbaugh had to know, yes, Yes, you didn't need to watch that documentary to understand Jim Harbaugh probably knew. That's Honestly, that's not even what the debate is here. The debate is what can the NCAA prove and what, what even is their punishment in 2024? Like if, if a lot of stuff is brought to evidence and brought to light, what, what's the punishment? Do we really think we live in a world with how valuable these assets are? And I mean that word, assets, that universities and networks are going to allow a bygone – enforcement arm like the NCAA to take away bowl trips to impose postseason bans like no one cares if they strip away wins in the past because everyone saw it happen but you think they're about to let them take scholarships and postseason trips away from one of the most valuable assets in the Big Ten I I don't think there's any world where that happens anymore I think it's a huge fine because everyone in the Big Ten would love to see Michigan get fined because that means they don't lose money but if Michigan is taken away from bowl contention and Michigan has scholarship stripped and it devalues them as a television asset. That means a lot of other people lose money. And I just don't think they're going to allow that. 
We we talked about a Jonathan Smith piece that the Athletic wrote about of him trying to turn Michigan State around. I'm just curious. A lot of hype for Oregon, Michigan being in the news, Ohio State being the favorites, all of that. Penn State maybe may with a shot to go to the playoff this year. What are expectations you think in East Lansing? Maybe not year one, even though Aiden Childs is saying take the over. When you think of Jonathan Smith and bringing over the amount of staff that he did, having Aiden Childs as low as they were, what are expectations maybe the first couple years for Jonathan Smith at Michigan State? Oh, I don't think they'll win anything this year. Um, I, I actually – I've talked to a couple of coaches who either recruited – against them or you know tried to get guys in the portal against them and Michigan State didn't even fight too hard and afterwards you reach out to Michigan State and you know Jonathan Smith will all but tell you we're not even going after one year guys because we're not we're not ready to win right now we have to rebuild a program so I think it's going to be that now the trade-off is they may have the most underrated coaching staff in the Big Ten no one knows them no one knows anything about them up there from a casual fan perspective Uh, they are very very good they will, leave, they will leave no stone unturned. They'll be supremely high level in the eval and development game. And that is absolutely what you have to have at Michigan State, by the way. So I, a year one, when you bring the quarterback over there, I know there could be a moment or two where they wow you, but by and large, that's at least a two-year rebuild. And then, then they're a, a, a sneaky contender up there because I do believe Michigan State is the most underrated program from a resource standpoint as well, Michigan state is so much more deep pocketed than people realize. Uh, it's just not realized as much because you're in the shadow of Michigan. Hmm, interesting. I, I'm curious to ask you, Josh. So we're getting ready to watch Oregon and Washington. A lot of these West coast teams play their first game. I I'm against playing, you know, these Oregon plays Idaho this weekend. And it's just a foregone conclusion. It's basically a scrimmage. So that's the downside. The plus side is you basically get to see everybody on the roster play and I'm a sicko. So I'm probably going to watch every second of it. Uh, if I throw Oregon at you in their biggest question mark, what, what's the first thing that stands out to you this year? Uh, competitive depth on the line of scrimmage and length in the secondary. Those are the two things I would look at. Not against Idaho. I mean, yeah. prayers for Idaho. But when you <laughs> when you start talking about Oregon, let's be real now. You're talking about a national title contender. So, therefore, you're talking about two or three games. You're talking about the Ohio State game, obviously. You're talking about uh, you know a trip to Michigan. Uh, they go to Wisconsin, too, don't they? They do, yeah. Yeah, late in the they season. Do. Yeah, so that's not a roster that matches up with them, but it's a first-time thing, so you never know. And so I, th- I think about that Ohio State game. Uh, Dylan Gabriel's n- not a guy with a Sunday arm, c- c- custom-made for the college game, and he's going to hang a lot of numbers on most teams he plays against that secondary where everything has to be a little bit quicker, everything has to be a little bit sharper, more finely tuned. How does he match up there? Um, how, how do they match up? I think that they are built on the line of scrimmage to compete in this league. But I thought they were built to handle Washington, and they didn't. So has a year made that big a difference there? And these are questions, not doubts. These mm-hmm. are questions, since you asked me in that, in that uh, context. Those are, those are the two or three biggest things that I'll be ready to see. And I'll tell you this, those are relatives. Those are, those are relative questions. Like down in the South, every time I do radio in Atlanta, they ask me, hey, what's the doubt about Georgia? Well, I don't think they have a vintage Georgia defensive front. Well, then that turns into 47 people on message boards saying, hey, he, said, he said Georgia's front sucks. No, I didn't. I said it's not. It, it's a little off from having the best of all time. That's what I'm saying. Uh, team in college football that you're most nervous is going to make you wrong. Like you, you have an idea or thought mm. on them, but they come out and they play better than you expect, and you're talking about how much better they are than you thought they would be. Oh, it'd clearly be Michigan because I'm not that high on Michigan. And, um, you know, if they, if they are able to find enough at quarterback, if they're able to ease themselves in and uh, they don't have to, you know, hang 50 because they'll still have a really dominant defense. If they're, if they're basically playing Iowa football, but they're just a little bit better at, you know, scoring and stuff, then Michigan does not play a murderer's row of a schedule. They could be right back there again. And you could be looking at yourself, and people could be looking at you saying, wow, the team won a title, and the culture, nothing changed about it, and you doubted them just because some players left? I could see that world. Now, I could also see a world where they're 8-4. and four. That's the world I think we live in. But as you guys know, 
There have been a couple of times in history I've been wrong, and I'm just hoping this is not the third or fourth time. I think that's, that's all I remember. Two or three times in the past is all yeah. I remember. The rest of it's a blank slate. Well, it's not your fault, man. It's the team's fault. I, you know, I, I don't know what they want from you, right? I mean, come on. We can't be, uh, we're not all experts here. Uh, two-parter to get you out of here, Josh. We love these conversations. Um, have we made a decision on October 12th yet? Uh, do you want to break any news on the show? And then <laughs> secondarily, I, I am a follower on the show, the socials, Josh Pate, CFP, or CFB, and, and uh, excited to see the behind-the-scenes in Gainesville. So for those who don't follow, what can they expect in the behind-the-scenes socials this weekend? All right, so last question first. I always had a fascination when I was growing up with the the behind-the-scenes of everything. Pro wrestling, football, it didn't matter. I wanted to know behind-the-scenes. And I always swore if I could ever do this job, I would show people as much behind-the-scenes as I could. Well, I do the job now. So I show people as much behind-the-scenes as I can. Now, the trade-off is you got to be sneaky about it because you get broadcast rights, deals, and whatnot, and you're technically not supposed to show this and that. But they don't ever check your Instagram story. So over at uh, – I'm still late kick Josh at the oh, moment on Instagram. Okay. Whatever. We'll just – I will make it work. But in that Instagram story throughout the day on Saturday, especially in a building as decrepit as Ben Hill Griffin Stadium, guys, I kid you not, the road locker room there <laughs> is, is worse than your mom's broom closet. It's crazy. <laughs> and so I'll show you as much as I possibly can any given Saturday of, like, what you're seeing – behind the scenes that you would never see on camera. And it's really, it's really fun. We have a lot of fun with it. We do Friday night lines on Instagram live too, late Friday nights, which would not be late for you. So that's the second part of the first part. I'm not ready to reveal anything, but mm. I will say this. If we're out there for that Ohio state, Oregon game, mm. and that's a later afternoon game, obviously I'm not getting a flight back to Nashville that night, which means I could see us doing the Sunday show out on the West coast. So that Ooh. that is just to be kept in the back of one's mind. Oh, hello, hello. Okay, you need at, studio space yeah, on the way yeah, to the airport. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we know some people. We, we know so. some people. You give us a call, Josh Pate, <laughs> CFB on Twitter. Go give him a follow. Still late, kick Josh on Instagram. Go give him a follow because it'll be great content behind the scenes. Not only this weekend, but every single weekend, and it's fun for me. A lot of stadiums I haven't been to, getting a look at uh, kind of what goes on. He had some great footage the other day of Lane Kiffin uh, talking with his agent on the phone with the whole Saban stuff going on. That was awesome. He's the host of the Josh Pate College Football Show every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, 5 o'clock our time, live on YouTube, Josh Pate College Football Podcast as well, and catch him on the CBS Sports HQ College Football Pregame Show. Always enjoy it. Thank God week one is here, and looking forward to next week, buddy. I appreciate it, guys. Have a good one. There you go. Josh Pate. Good stuff from him talking college football. It's nice to talk to him. It's good. It's going to be fun every single week. I, it's funny. It sucks I, when we don't have any relevant games out here to like no, really hone in on. Never really have. I mean, USC LSU is one, and we got yeah. to that because that's a West Coast yep. school. But everybody else, uh, we got Washington State, Portland State. Washington Weber State and oh. our schools play Idaho. Yeah, feel feel the excitement in the air. Catch the fever. Will any of those games be within twenty? <laughs> I hope. You got fire not. in your gut. You got to fire in your gut for the yeah. Idaho's this weekend. Yeah, USC is my my answer to the question I asked him. Which team can prove people the most wrong? Yeah, yeah. Because I think if their new D coordinator actually you know makes their defense respectable. I'm not so much worried about the offense of USC. Shouldn't be. I think they'll figure that out with Miller yeah. Moss. But if their defense cannot be, you know, what they were the last two years, they're an interesting program to maybe not go to the playoff or win the Big Ten, mm-hmm. but to be a real thorn and a, an annoyance okay. in that conference.